بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب فضائل الصحابة The Virtue of the Sahaba and we are on the chapter of the Fadail who pledged allegiance under the tree from Hafsa the Prophet said لا يدخل النار إن شاء الله من أصحاب الشجرة أحد إن شاء الله no one from the people of the tree will enter the fire Hafsa said بلا يا رسول الله yes some will O Messenger of Allah and the Prophet scolded her and Hafsa says Allah Jalla wa ala says وَإِن مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا there is none of you except who will come to it meaning the fire but then the Prophet answered but Allah goes on to say ثُمَّ نُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ وَنَذَرُ الظَّالِمِينَ فِيهَا جِثِيَّةً but we will rescue those who have taqwa and the ظَالِمِين will be left kneeling in the fire what the Prophet is talking about when he says the people of the tree are those who pledged allegiance to the Prophet under the tree called the Bay'atul Ridwan the allegiance of pleasure this is because Allah Jalla wa ala is pleased with those people who pledged allegiance Uthman ibn Affan had gone to the Mushrikeen to negotiate a truce and this was before the Treaty of Hudaybiyah the return of Uthman was delayed and rumors started to spread that Uthman has been killed of course this would worry the Muslimin so the Prophet gathered them all together and made them pledge allegiance that they will not run away if push comes to shove they have to fight because killing a messenger is a declaration of war and so that these Muslims will not run away even if they have to give up their lives Allah Jalla wa ala says about those companions لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ Allah is pleased Ridwan He is pleased with those Mu'mineen who gave you the pledge of allegiance under the tree we also find it is vital to understand the ayat of the Qur'an in the proper context. Yes, Allah Jalla wa ala says that everyone will come to the fire, but not everyone will enter into it. The ones with taqwa will be saved, and only the kuffar and the munafiqeen will be thrown in. Hafsa here is not rejecting what the Prophet has said. This is not possible from any Sahabi. What Hafsa is doing is that she's questioning the Prophet's decision further to learn more. Because she has some evidence which apparently contradicts what the Prophet has said. And so she is displaying this evidence in order to gain a clearer understanding. Otherwise you'll just remain in confusion with two evidences colliding with each other in your mind. Next, the Fadail of Abu Musa and Abu Amir al-Ash'ariyeen. This is a longer narration. Abu Burda reports from his father. After the Battle of Hunayn, the Prophet sent Abu Amir as the head of the army to Awtas. He had a fight with Duraid as Simma, whom he defeated, and his army. Abu Musa says that the Prophet sent me and Abu Amir, and Abu Amir received a wound in his knee from an arrow shot by a man from Banu Jusham. He says, I went to him and asked, Uncle, who shot you? Abu Amir pointed out to the man. Abu Musa says that I followed him with the determination to kill him. He says, when he saw me, he turned upon his heels, and I followed him. I said to him, do you not feel ashamed that you're running, meaning like a coward? Are you not an Arab? Why don't you stop? He stopped and Abu Musa had an encounter with him. He said, I struck him with the sword and killed him. I came back to Abu Amr and said, verily Allah has killed the one who killed you. He drew out the arrow. He said, oh my nephew, go to the Prophet and convey the greeting and say that Abu Amr begs you to ask forgiveness for him. Abu Amr died a short time after. Abu Musa came to the Prophet, who was lying in a bed of strings. He narrated to him what happened. Abu Amr had died. The Prophet called for water and performed wudu. He then lifted his hands and said, Allahumma ghafir li Ubaid Abi Amr. Oh Allah, forgive Ubaid Abu Amr. He did this until I saw the whiteness of his armpits. That's how far up he raised his hands. Allahumma ja'aluhu yawm al qiyamati fawqa kathirin min khalqik. And Abu Musa said, O Messenger of Allah, make dua for me as well to forgive me. And the Prophet said, Allahumma ghafir li Abdullah bin Qais dhamba wa adakhilhu yawm al qiyamati mudkhalan karima. O Allah, forgive Abdullah bin Qais and he is Abu Musa al Ash'ari and give him a noble entrance on yawm al qiyamah. So in this narration, there is a fadila for both Abu Amr and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari in that the Prophet made dua for them both the next chapter about the Fala'il of the Ash'ariyeen and this is a tribe from Yemen from Abu Musa that the Prophet said 
then I can recognize the voice of the Ash'ariyin when they recite the Qur'an. And I'm also able to recognize the place where they are staying because of their voices in reciting the Qur'an by night time, even if I have not actually seen their encampment when they descend by daytime. And amongst them, there is a wise man. When he meets the enemies, he says to them, my companions order you to wait for them. We find from this narration the Prophet speaking highly of the Ash'aliyin because they recite the Qur'an beautifully and we can take that you're allowed to recite the Qur'an in a loud voice by night time as long as you will not disturb anyone. And amongst them there is a Hakim, a wise man, who uses this strategy of war telling the enemies, wait for my companions. He thus gives the impression to the enemies that he has a large army coming behind him. Also in the chapter, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari reports, now the Prophet said that when the Ash'ariyin run short of provisions in the campaigns or run short of food for their children in al Madina, they collect whatever is with them in a cloth and they share it amongst themselves. They are from me and I am from them. So we take from this narration that the Ash'ariyin have unity during times of difficulty. We take that they are accommodating, they are selfless, they are united, they are intelligent, they lead a simple austere life, nothing too flashy. The Prophet says that they are from me and I am from them. So this shows us that they are on the right path. The next chapter about the Fadail of Abu Sufyan ibn Harb radiallahu an ibn Abbas reports that the Muslims would neither look to Abu Sufyan with respect, nor would they sit with him. And the reason for that is because they simply did not trust him after his long enmity against the Muslimin. And because of this, Abu Sufyan wanted to prove himself to the Muslimin that he is a genuine Muslim and not just a, a fake. So Abu Sufyan said to the Prophet, O Prophet, give me three things. The Prophet said, yes. Abu Sufyan says, I have the most beautiful of women of the Arab. Um Habiba bin Abi Sufyan, I marry you to her. The Prophet said yes. And then he said, Muawiyah, with his son, you make him your scribe. And the Prophet said yes. And then he asked, make me commander of the army that I should fight the Kuffar, just like I used to fight the Muslims. And the Prophet said yes. Making Muawiyah the scribe of the Prophet and making Abu Sufyan himself a commander of the army is not really a problem. The problematic area of this narration is this marriage to Umm Habiba. The Prophet married Umm Habiba some years before Abu Sufyan embraced Islam. Abu Sufyan embraced Islam in the year of the conquest of Mecca and the Prophet married Umm Habiba many years before that. So how can a marriage contract be concluded when it has already been concluded? Allah knows best but perhaps a way to reconcile this is that Abu Sufyan wants to give his blessing to the marriage, whereas before he was a kafir, and a kafir cannot marry a Muslim woman to a Muslim man. But now he wants to give it his blessing, and the Prophet agreed. The next chapter about the Fadail of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and Asma bin Umais and the people of the ship, radiallahu anhum. Abu Musa reports that we were in Yemen and we heard of the migration of the Prophet. We went to him. And I was accompanied by two brothers, and I was the younger of the three. And there were 53 or 52 men of my tribe. We embarked on a boat and it sailed to the Najashi ruler of Habasha. We met Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, who commanded us to stay with them. And then we went to al Madina to meet the Prophet. When Khaybar had been conquered, he says, the Prophet allotted a share to the ones who had been present at the Battle of Khaybar, not to the ones who were not present. However, he made an exception for Ja'far and his companions. And some people said to us, we have preceded you in the migration. Also in the chapter, Asma bin Umais had come to al Madina. She had been one of those who migrated to Abyssinia or Habasha. When Umar saw Asma, he asked his daughter Hafsa, is she the Abyssinian? Meaning to say, is she from those who migrated to Abyssinia? Hafsa said yes. Umar said to Asma, we preceded you in the migration. So we have more right to the Prophet than you do. And to this Asma felt annoyed. And she said to Umar, You have spoken falsehood. You had the privilege of being in the company of the Prophet, feeding the hungry and teaching the ignorant, whilst we were in Abyssinia, a land hated to us, and only for the sake of Allah and his Messenger. 
by Allah, I will not eat or drink anything until I tell the Prophet what you have said. We remained in that country in trouble and dread, and I shall talk to the Prophet about what you have said. And by Allah, I shall not tell a lie, nor deviate from the truth, nor add anything from my own self. So Asma reported this to the Prophet, and the Prophet said to her, that Umar does not have more right than you. For Umar and his companions, there is one hijrah. But for you, the people of the ship, you have two hijrah. She said, I saw Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and the people of the boat, that is those who migrated to Abyssinia, coming to me in groups asking me about this hadith because there was nothing more delightful to their ears than this hadith. Asma said, I saw Abu Musa asking me to repeat this hadith to him again and again. It's interesting to note here that the Prophet calls the Hijrah to Abyssinia a Hijrah, that is to say a praiseworthy Hijrah, because he likens it to the Hijrah from Mecca to al Madinah. But the peculiar point here is that the Hijrah to Abyssinia was a Hijrah to a Kafir country. Yet the Prophet counts this as a Hijrah. And the reason is because this was done for Allah Jalla wa ala and the Messenger. And whoever makes Hijrah for Allah and the Messenger, then his Hijrah is for Allah and the Messenger as we know from the famous hadith, that this could be to a kafir country, as long as it is for the sake of Allah and the Messenger, such as was the case with the people of the boat, like Asma bint Umais and her companions. But this would not include making hijrah to a kafir country simply for economic reasons, because there are better job prospects and so on. No, rather this hijrah needs to be for Allah and the Messenger in order to safeguard your deen, because maybe in your particular land, you cannot practice your deen. Next, we move to the Fadail of Salman, Suhaib and Bilal radiallahu anhum. Abu Sufyan came to Salman, Suhaib and Bilal in the presence of some group of people. These three companions said to Abu Sufyan, by Allah, the sword of Allah did not reach the neck of the enemy of Allah as it was required to reach. And they said this to Abu Sufyan after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when the Muslimin were enraged by this lopsided treaty. Abu Bakr said to them, Do you say this to a chief of the Quraysh, meaning Abu Sufyan? Then he came to the Prophet and informed him. The Prophet said to Abu Bakr, Ya Abu Bakr, لَعَلَّكَ أَغْضَبْتَهُمْ لَإِن كُنْتَ أَغْضَبْتَهُمْ لَقَدْ أَغْضَبْتَ رَبَّكَ Abu Bakr, Perhaps you have angered them, meaning angered Salman, Suhaib and Bilal. If it is the case that you have angered them, then you have angered your Rabb. To this, Abu Bakr went back to those three and he said, O oh, my brothers, have I angered you? La yaghfirullahu laka ya ukhayya. They said, No, may Allah forgive you, our brother. All three of these companions, Salman al-Farisi, Suhaib al-Rumi and Bilal ibn Rabah, all three, of course, incidentally, non-Arab, all three were poor and were looked down upon by the Kuffar because they did not have high status. The Prophet feared here that Abu Bakr did not speak to these poor people in a gentle way. He was too rough with them and perhaps he had angered them. Now all three of these companions were mistreated by the leaders of the Quraysh and so they felt that they did not really take their just revenge. It is imperative we learn from this narration to lower the wings of submission to the mu'mineen, even if they are poor and lowly in status, Allah Jalla wa ala orders the Prophet, وَاخْفِضْ جَنَاحَكَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ and lower your wings for the mu'mineen. We learn from the narration that these three companions are from the awliya of Allah Jalla wa ala, because if you anger them, then you've angered Allah. And this is similar to the hadith, مَنْ عَادَ وَلِيًّا لِي فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Whoever declares enmity to a wali of mine, then I give him notice of war, Allah Jalla wa ala is saying. So if you anger a wali of Allah Jalla wa ala, then you have angered Allah. In this narration, there is also a virtue of Abu Bakr in that he wants to immediately clear himself of any blame. This is why he goes back to the people and asks him, did I anger you? Because if he did, he is going to seek forgiveness immediately, as he does not want to come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah having angered Allah Jalla wa ala. The next chapter about the Fadail of the Ansar radiallahu anhum. Jabir ibn Abdullah reports about the ayah in Surah Ali Imran إِذْ هَمَّ الطَّائِفَتَانِ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ تَفْشَلَهُ وَاللَّهُ وَلِيُّهُمَا When two groups amongst you are about to lose heart and Allah was their ally. It says the two groups were Banu Salama and Banu Haritha. 
and they were glad that Allah revealed this verse, giving them assurance that Allah is their ally. So in this there is a clear virtue of Banu Salama and Banu Haritha. Also in the chapter, Zayd ibn Arqam, that the Prophet said, Allahumma ghafir lil ansar wa li abna'i al ansar wa abna'i abna'i al ansar. O oh Allah, forgive the ansar and their children and their grandchildren. So in this narration, there's a virtue for the Ansar in that the Prophet is making dua not only for them, but for their children and their grandchildren. The true Mu'min has long-range vision when it comes to his family. So that would include his children and children's children. Do we not see that the wife of Imran made dua for her child, who was Maryam, and her child in turn, who would be Isa ibn Maryam? She sought protection from Shaytan for her child and her child's child. Likewise, Ibrahim السلام, made dua to Allah Jalla wa to send a messenger to his children and his children's children, so his progeny down the line, who will recite to them the ayat of Allah and will purify them. Also, Anas reports that a woman from the Ansar came to the Prophet and the Prophet was in privacy with her and he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ إِنَّكُمْ لَأَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَيَّ By the one who has my soul in his hand, you people, meaning the Ansar, are the most beloved people to me. He said this three times. Who was this woman? Well, it is possible that this woman is a mahram to the Prophet, so he can be in privacy with her. Or the khalwa mentioned in the narration could also be that it was a private question asked, but he was not alone with her because he was with other people. It's just that they did not know what this woman and the Prophet were talking about because maybe it was a private matter. Also, Anas reports that the Prophet said, "Inna al-ansara karishi wa ibati wa inna al-nasa la yakthruna wa yuqillun faqbalu min muhsinihim wa afu an musiihim." The Ansar are my family and my trusted friends. The people are going to increase and they will decrease. So accept the good deeds of the one who does good amongst them, but overlook the one who does bad amongst them. The next chapter about the best homes of the Ansar. From Abu Usaid, the Prophet said, خَيْرُ دُورِ الْأَنصَارِ بَنُ نَجَّارِ ثُمَّ بَنُ عَبْدِ الْأَشْحَلِ ثُمَّ بَنُ الْحَارِثِ ابن الْخَزْرَجِ ثُمَّ بَنُ سَاعِدَةِ The best houses of the Ansar are first Banu Najjar and then Banu Abd al-Ashhal and then Banu al-Harith ibn al-Khazraj and then Banu Sa'idah. وَفِي كُلِّ دُورِ الْأَنصَارِ خَيْرِ but in every house of the Ansar there is goodness. To this, Sa'ad said, I see that the Prophet has preferred others above us. But it was then said to him, But he has preferred you above many others. And this is Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, who was from the Banu Sa'idah tribe. And as we have just heard, the Prophet deemed certain other tribes to be better than Banu Sa'idah. So we find here that there is no doubt that some homes are more virtuous than others. But in all homes of the Ansar, there is goodness. And in this, there is a fadila for all the Ansar. But it's just that people are not equal in their fadila, in their virtue. This is a well-known concept. Even amongst messengers, they are not equal. Some are more virtuous than others. Tilka rusulu ala ba'd. The next chapter, about the goodness of keeping company with the Ansar. Anas ibn Malik reports, I set out with Jarir ibn Abdullah, on a journey and he used to serve me and I told him do not do that that is do not serve me to which Jarir said I have seen the Ansar serving the Messenger of Allah and I swore by Allah that whenever I accompany an Ansari that I would serve him and it is reported that Jarir was older than Anas ibn Malik and this may be the reason why Anas said do not serve me because Jarir is older so we find that even if Jarir was older he had much respect for the Ansar of which Anas ibn Malik was one. Not just anyone, of course, he was from the foremost. The next chapter about the dua of the Prophet to the tribe of Ghifar and Aslam. From Abu Dhar, the Prophet said, Ghifar ghafar Allahu laha wa Aslam salamah Allah. As for the tribe of Ghifar, Allah has forgiven them, and as for the tribe of Aslam, Allah has granted them salama or has safeguarded them. And the longer version of this narration has proceeded. The next chapter about the fadail of Ghifar, Aslam, Juhayna, Ashja, Muzayna, Tamim, Daus, and Tay. These are all names of different tribes. From Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, that the Prophet said, The tribes of Ansar 
Muzayna, Juhayna, Ghifar, and Ashja, and those from Bani Abdullah are my close allies, and Allah and His Messenger are their allies. So here we find the Prophet speaking highly of these particular tribes, and hence this is a fadila for them. Also in the chapter, Abu Huraira reports that the Prophet was told, O Messenger of Allah, the tribe of Daus has disbelieved in Allah and has rejected the message. So make dua to Allah against them. And it was said, Halakat Daus, that the tribe of Daus has been destroyed. But the Prophet said, Allahumma hdi dawsan wa'ti bihim. O Allah, guide the tribe of Daus and bring them to me. So we find here that you are allowed to make dua for the kuffar, for their guidance, not for their forgiveness of sins. That can only be for Muslims. Because better than the kuffar being destroyed is that the kuffar should be guided. The next chapter about the best of people from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, Tajidun an nasa ma'adin fakhiaruhum fil jahiliya khiaruhum fil islami idha faqihu wa tajiduna min khayrin nasi fi hadha al amr akrahahum lahu qabla an yaqa'a fi wa tajiduna min shirar al nasi dhal wajhain alladhi yati ha'ulai bi wajhin wa ha'ulai bi wajh he will find the people to be like roots of a tree. The best of them in the Jahiliya will also be the best of them in Islam as long as they gain an understanding of the deen, that is, fiqh. And you will find the best of people in this matter of Islam to be the one who hated Islam the most before he embraced Islam. And you will find from the worst of people the one who is two-faced. He behaves in a certain way with one type of people but in another way with another type of people. This is really the same hadith as we found in the Fadila of Yusuf السلام, when some people came and asked the Prophet about the best type of people. Then he mentioned that the best person is the one who has most taqwa. They said, we're not asking about that. Then he said, well then it is Yusuf, the Prophet of Allah, the son of the Prophet, son of a Prophet and son of a Prophet. So he has the best lineage. They said, we are not asking about that. And then the Prophet gave this answer. He says the people are like roots, just like the roots of a tree. If the roots are good, then the branches will also be good. So if your background and your family is of a noble and good family, then you're likely to be just like that as well. And he illustrates this by saying that the best people in the days of Jahiliya will also be the best in Islam as well. So that is to say your background is of a noble background. So even as a non-Muslim, this person has great qualities. And this is true, a non-Muslim can have great qualities in his character. And so if that's the case and he embraces Islam, then he brings all of his great qualities into his life as a Muslim. And hence he will be from the best of those who are Muslims as well. But on the condition that he gains an understanding of the deen. And from this we learn the importance of studying the deen and gaining knowledge. And he interestingly says that the best type of people in this matter of Islam will be the ones who hated it the most before they entered into it. And we can give some names. Umar ibn al-Khattab, Khalid ibn Walid, Umar ibn al-As, Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl, Suhail ibn Umar, Thumama bint Uthal, who told the Prophet when he entered Islam that your face was the most hated to me and now it is the most beloved and your deen was the most hated to me out of all the Adiyan but now it is the most beloved. And likewise with all these other aforementioned men, they were vehement in their hatred against Islam yet they came to be prominent companions of the Prophet. And if that is the case then, then there's no reason why it should not be the case today. And hence all the more reason to not lose hope. And so you'll find their vehement hatred for Islam turning into love. And then the third point to mention in the hadith, the worst types of people are the two-faced ones. So he's talking about the hypocrites. وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا When they meet the believers, they say, we believe. وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهَزِئُونَ And when they are in private with their fellow shayateen, that is their fellow hypocrites, and kuffar, they say, we are actually with you, we were only mocking the Muslims. So any form of hypocrisy or two-facedness is to be rejected and is evil. The next chapter about the women of the Quraysh. From Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, نِسَاءُ قُرَيْشْ خَيْرُ نِسَاءٍ رَكِبْنَ الْإِبِلْ أَحْنَاهُ عَلَى طِفْلْ وَأَرْعَاهُ عَلَى زَوْجٍ فِي ذَاتِ يَدِهِ The women of the Quraysh are the best women who have ridden the camel. They are the most compassionate to children 
and most effective at guarding their husband's wealth. Abu Huraira says at the end of this narration that Maryam bint Amran never rode a camel. So in this narration we find the clear-cut fadila of the women of the Quraysh in that they are compassionate to their children and guard the wealth of their husbands most effectively. He says they are the best women who have ridden the camel. So out of all of the Arab women, the women of the Quraysh are the best ones. And out of any other woman who has ridden the camel. This hadith does not mean to say that each member of the women of the Quraysh is better than each member of a non Qurayshiyah. No, rather the Prophet is speaking in general terms. Otherwise, you could find if you have an individual contest that a woman from a non Quraysh is better than a woman from the Quraysh. That is certainly possible. As in, for example, a Tabi'i is better or more virtuous than a Tabi or Tabi'i. But it could be that a Tabi or Tabi'i individually is better than a Tabi'i. That is on a one-to-one -one match up, but this is not the case on a general scale. Generally, the tabi'un are better than the tabi' tabi'un. Or for example, men are stronger than women. That is true. But you might find an individual woman who is stronger than an individual man. We may take from this narration that the best type of woman is the one who is merciful and compassionate to the children and guards the husband's wealth and is loyal to him. And in this, for the man, there is also an encouragement to choose good women whom you're going to marry. There is a narration, Choose wisely for your semen and marry those who are similar to you. Because the tarbiyah of your children begins before you marry. It begins when you choose your spouse. So you do not want to have children with just any type of woman. That could be a nightmare. Because if she is evil herself, then she is going to produce evil children. Just like in the previous hadith. Tajidun al nas ma'adin. You will find the people to be like roots. If a person's background and his roots are righteous, then he is likely to be righteous as well. Conversely, the Prophet ﷺ said, Waladu zina sharru thalath. The child of zina is the worst of the three because he is going to grow up to be even more of a zani than his parents. And we can witness this in the Kufar countries today. Promiscuity is growing generation after generation. Also notice that the virtue of a woman lies in her being either a mother, just as the Prophet said, Ahnahu ala tifl, most compassionate to children, or it lies in her virtue as a wife, as the Prophet said, Wa ara'ahu ala zawjin fi dhati yadi, most effectively protecting the wealth of their husbands. This is where the virtue of the woman lies either as a mother or as a wife. Similarly, we find Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, being compassionate to Musa alayhi salam. We find the wife of Imran making dua for her children. We find Maryam and her relationship with her son, Isa alayhi salam. From the Prophet's lifetime, Fatima, Khadija, Aisha. And we can go on naming names. The point is that a woman's virtue lies in either her being a wife or being a mother. In particular, it does not lie in being a single person or worse yet, a'udhu billah, in being somebody's secret paramour or how you say girlfriend. As Allah Jalla wa Ala warns, فَانْكِحُوهُنَّ بِإِذْنِ أَهْلِهِنَّ وَآتُوهُنَّ أُجُورَهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ مُحْصَنَاتٍ غَيْرَ مُسَافِحَاتٍ وَلَا مُتَّخِذَاتِ أَخْدَانٍ So marry them with the permission of the wali and give them the mahar with due right, that they should be guarding their chastity, talking about the women, not committing fornication and not taking secret paramours, that is to say boyfriends. So the virtue of the woman does not lie in how the kuffar want the woman to be, being single, having paramours, being promiscuous, showing her skin. In the kuffar's eyes, the woman has value up to the level of the beauty which she displays in public. So she is like a commodity. Soon she will be out of date and the new batch needs to come in. So just look at the difference in mentality between guidance and misguidance. Also, her virtue does not lie in her being a successful businesswoman or a successful career woman, which is what the kuffar want to poison your mind with. So be warned and take heed. Notice how Abu Huraira at the end says that Maryam bint Imran did not ride a camel. Why does he say this? Because he's saying 
that the women of the Quraysh are not more virtuous or superior to Maryam and that the Prophet is talking about those women who have ridden the camel. But Maryam did not ride a camel, so she is not included in this hadith. Otherwise, Maryam is superior to the women of the Quraysh. And indeed, there is no doubt this is the case. There are no women who can step toe-to-toe -to -toe with Maryam. Let's move to the next chapter. The fraternity established by the Prophet amongst the companions. Anas reports that the Prophet established a feeling of brotherhood between Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah and Abu Talha. So it may be that these two were at loggerheads with each other and had enmity between them, but the Prophet ﷺ established brotherhood between Abu Ubaidah and Abu Talha. Also in the chapter, it was said to Anas, you must have heard the Prophet say, La hilfa fil Islam. There is no allegiance in Islam. Anas responded by saying, but the Prophet established fraternity or a sense of brotherhood between the Quraysh and the Ansar in his home. We say to this hadith, Anas is correct, but also the statement is also correct. The Prophet did say, La hilfa fil Islam. And in other narrations, this is clear. But the hilf or the allegiance he's talking about is the allegiance that would give rise to people inheriting from each other. And we know this cannot happen except if you're a family member or you're married or through the wala, that is a person frees a servant. In the days of Jahiliyyah, if you had an allegiance with someone, you could also inherit from him and Islam came to abrogate that. This is why the Prophet said, La hilfa fil Islam. There is no allegiance in Islam. Otherwise, there is allegiance in Islam. There's no doubt about that. You can enter into peace treaties and allegiances with other people. That is fine. But it's the inheritance which is the problem. And that is what the Prophet is targeting. The next chapter. The presence of the Prophet is a source of security for the Sahaba. And the presence of the Sahaba is a source of security for the Ummah. Abu Burda reports, We offered the Maghrib prayer with the Prophet. And we decided to keep sitting and offer the Salat al-Isha with the Prophet as well. And they did so. And so the Prophet came out and said to them, You are still sitting here? And they said, Yes, we decided to keep waiting and offer the Salat al Usha with you as well. The Prophet said, Ahsantum or Asabtum. He said, You did well, or he said, You did right. He says that the Prophet raised his head to the sky, and he would raise his head to the sky much. The Prophet said, An Nujumu Amanatun Lissama. The stars are a security for the sky. Faida Dhahabat in Nujum. When the stars go away, there comes to the sky what is promised to it. And I am a source of security for my companions. And when I leave, they will come to my companions their fate, or what they are promised. And my companions are a security for my ummah and when they leave they will come to my ummah what they are promised we find from this narration the virtue of waiting for the salah after praying the last salah because the prophet told them ahsantum you did well or he said asabtum you did the right thing we learn importantly from this narration that the prophet is a security for the sahaba that is to say to ward off any fitna and any infighting and so on the sahaba are a security for the rest of the ummah that is to say to ward off the fitna just as the stars are a security for the sky. Now what does that mean? Are the stars guarding the sky? Well, what it means is that when the stars vanish on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, then so will the sky cease to exist. As long as the stars are in existence, so does the sky exist. But on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the stars will vanish and the sky will also split asunder. So in this hadith, there is a virtue for the Prophet himself, but also for the companions. And it is obligatory to love and venerate the companions and to overlook any shortcoming that they had. The next chapter about the merits of the Sahaba and the two generations after them. Abu Sa'id al Khudri reports that the Prophet said a time would come that some people from my Ummah will go out fighting. It would be asked, is there a Sahabi amongst them? And they will say yes, and they will be granted victory. And then another detachment will be sent out. And it would be asked, is there anyone who saw a companion? And the answer would be yes. And they will be granted victory as well. And then another detachment sent out. And it would be asked, is there anyone who saw a tabi'i amongst you? And it would be said yes. And victory will be granted to them. The Prophet is foretelling a near future because he's saying something about the companions and they are close to him in time frame. 
And what he said exactly happened. The companions were the ones who conquered many lands and victory was granted to them. The Prophet in this hadith is talking about the first three generations, the companions, the tabi'een, and the tabi'ur tabi'een. And he's telling us that they are going to go out fighting in the way of Allah and victory will be granted to them. And indeed, in Islamic history, most of the victory was granted to these early generations where Iman was strong. Nowadays, you find the Muslims are weak. The Kuffar do not fear them. Rather, it's the other way around. They fear the Kuffar. What's the reason for this? Because this current generation is nowhere near close to the first three generations. And your victory depends on your Iman, nothing else. So it is no surprising that the Kuffar have no fear of the Muslims and are bossing the Muslims about. We ask Allah Jalla wa ala to turn the tables. As he himself says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ And these are the days we rotate amongst people. Also from Imran ibn Hussain that the Prophet said, إِنَّ خَيْرَكُمْ قَرْنِ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of you, meaning the best of Muslims, is my generation, then those who followed them, then those who followed them, then those who followed them. Imran said, I do not know whether he mentioned it twice after his generation or three times. Then the Prophet goes on to say, ثُمَّ يَكُونُوا بَعْدَهُمْ قَوْمٌ يَشْهَدُونَ وَلَا يُسْتَشْهَدُونَ وَيَخُونُونَ وَلَا يُؤْتَمَنُونَ وَيَنظُرُونَ وَلَا يُوفُونَ وَيَظْهَرُ فِيهِمُ السِّمَنَ And then there will appear after them a nation who will give testimony without being called to do so. They will be treacherous and cannot be trusted. They will give a vow yet fail to fulfill it. Let's first point out that the Prophet is speaking about the first three generations, not the first four. And we know that from the other narrations. So in this particular narration, he goes up to the first four generations. And that is wrong. It is meant to be the first three generations. When he says, Inna khayrakum, Verily the best of you. Who is you? Is it you as in the Muslims of this Ummah? Or is it you as in the whole Ummah after the Prophets? Because this Ummah can be divided up into two. Ummah to Da'wah. The Ummah to whom the da'wah of Islam has reached, and this includes literally everybody, Muslim and Kafir. And then we have the Ummatul Ijaba, the Ummah of response. These are the people who responded to the call, to the da'wah of the Prophet, and that would have to be only Muslims. Well, the point is, it makes little difference, because if you are the best of the Muslims, then clearly you are the best of the Ummatul Da'wah. And if you are the best of the Ummatul Da'wah, then you have to be from the Muslims, no doubt about it because the Muslim is superior to the Kafir. He has Fadila with Allah Jalla wa ala. The Kafir has no Fadila. The ulama call these first three generations Al-Qurun al-Thalathatul Mufaddala The first three virtuous generations. So the Tabi'un are better than the Tabi'ur Tabi'een on a general scale, but not necessarily on an individual scale. Like we said, as for the Sahaba, then no one from the non-Sahabi can be equal to a Sahabi, just as no one from a non-Prophet can be equal to a Prophet. Then he mentions those people who come afterwards. They will give a testimony when they're not asked to do so. And we have to understand this in the proper way, because otherwise it will clash with the other hadith, which talks about the best of those who testify are those who give their testimony when they are not asked to do so. And the way to reconcile is to say that these people in this particular hadith are the untrustworthy people. They're giving a testimony of falsehood. As the hadith itself goes on to say, that they will yakhunun, they will be treacherous, wala yu'tamanun, and they are not people who can be entrusted. Other interpretations are also given. For example, if you know that somebody's rights are going to be lost, and you are a witness, then you give your testimony, even if you are not called to do it, because the owner of the right may not be aware that you are a witness. Whereas, if there are other witnesses who can testify, then you do not give your testimony before being asked for it. So this is another interpretation. And they will make a vow and fail to fulfill it. It is obligatory to fulfill your vow if it is a matter of ibadah, such as fasting or salah or giving charity and so on. And fatness will appear amongst them. This is because they will indulge in the luxuries of this life, neglecting the hereafter. As for these generations, Ibn Taymiyyah says that a generation is defined by the majority of the people. So if the majority of the people are companions, then that's the companion's generation. 
And if the majority of the people are tabi'een, then that is a tabi'een generation, and likewise with the tabi'u tabi'een. In any case, if we look at the stretch of these people, the last companion was Abu Tufail, died in the year 110 Hijri, exactly 100 years after the Prophet's death. The last of the Tabi'in was in the year 170, and the last of the Tabi'u Tabi'in in the year 220. It is worth noting here as well that our deen needs to be understood in the way that these generations understood it, because their aqidah was pure, their hearts were purer, and least corrupted. As for afterwards, corruptions came in from external kuffar influences. This had an effect on the aqidah. It even had an effect on the Arabic language. So if you want to practice the deen the way the Prophet practiced it, then these are the generations you need to look for when it comes to interpreting the Qur'an and the ahadith. And beware of new contemporary tafasir of the Qur'an and the ahadith. The Prophet ﷺ in the Muqaddimah of Sahih Muslim himself said, سَيَكُونُ فِي آخِرِ الزَّمَانِ قَوْمٌ يُحَدِّثُونَكُمْ بِمَا لَمْ تَسْمَعُوا أَنْتُمْ وَلَا آبَاؤُكُمْ فَإِيَّاكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ There will come during the end of the time some people who will tell you things which neither you nor your fathers heard before. So beware of them. The next chapter about the Prophet saying, No one will be alive 100 years from now. From Abu Sa'id, he says that when the people came back from the expedition of Tabuk, they asked him about the last hour. And the Prophet said, لا تأتي مئة سنة وعلى الأرض نفس منفوسة اليوم After 100 years, no one who is alive today will be present. And this is interesting because like we said, the last companion, Abu Tufail, died 100 years after the Prophet's death. So it is just how the Prophet said. In this narration, there is evidence that Al-Khadr is not alive today. As some people claim that Al-Khadr is still alive and he will be alive during the time of the Dajjal as well. And this is false. There is no evidence for that. Al-Khadr is a man just like any other man who died during his time. This narration would appear to clash with the hadith of Al-Jassasa, the spy of Al-Dajjal, where the companion Tamim Al-Dari actually met Al-Dajjal. And that narration is in Sahih Muslim. But we know Al-Dajjal is yet to come, so that would mean he's still alive today. But that would mean he's been alive for longer than 100 years, which would clash with this hadith. If that hadith is authentic and we find nothing wrong with the hadith of Al-Jassasa, then we could say that that hadith of Al-Jassasa is simply an exception to the general case of this hadith. The next chapter about abusing the Sahaba. Abu Sa'id says that there was some altercation between Khalid ibn Walid and Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Khalid reviled him and in response the Prophet said to Khalid, لا تسبوا أحدا من أصحابي فإن أحدكم لو أنفق مثل أحد ذهب ما أدرك مد أحدهم ولا نصيفة. Do not revile anyone from my companions, for if one of you spends the whole of Uhud in gold, it will not even equal one mud of what my Sahaba spent, not even a half of it. We find here that whatever the Sahabi spent is worth more than what you will spend. So it's not about the amount that you spend. It's about the value of what you spend. Why is this? Well, because the Sahaba spent their wealth as well as their effort and energy during a time when it was difficult for the Prophet and the Mushrikun were more powerful. So that's why spending even a little amount is worth more than 10 times its amount during other times of safety and security and when the Muslims are more powerful than the Kuffar. So we have to look at the value of what you're spending, not the amount or quantity of what is being spent. As Allah Jalla wa Ala himself says, لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل Not equal are those who spent before the conquest of Mecca and fought. So they are more virtuous than those who fought afterwards. Why? Because times were difficult before the conquest of Mecca. The Mushrikun had the upper hand. So the value of your effort was far more during times of distress and difficulty. In any case, in this hadith, there was a clear warning against anyone who abuses anyone from the Sahaba. Yet you find the Rafida abusing most of the Sahaba, in fact, sending the curse upon Abu Bakr and Umar is to them a means of drawing closer to Allah Jalla wa'ala. The next chapter about the Fadail of Uwais al-Qarni. 
from Usayr ibn Jabir, he reports that a delegation from Kufa came to Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was the Khalifa. And there was a man amongst them who made fun of another man called Uwais. Umar said to this delegation, Is there a man amongst you called Uwais from the place of Qaran? They said yes. Umar met this man and he reported a hadith from the Prophet, Inna rajulan ya'tikum min al-Yaman yuqalu lahu Uwais. A man from al-Yaman will come to you. His name is Uwais. La yada'u bil-Yaman ghayra ummin lah. He will only leave behind in Yemen his mother. وَقَدْ كَانَ بِهِ بَيَاضُ And he had some leprosy on his skin. فَدَعَ اللَّهَ فَأَذْهَبَهُ عَنْ And this man made dua to Allah and Allah cured him of this skin condition. إِلَّا مَوْضِعَ الدِّينَارِ أَوْ دِرْهَمْ Except for an area of a dinar or dirham. فَمَنْ لَقِيَهُ مِنْكُمْ فَلْيَسْتَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ So whoever meets him, then let this man, meaning always, seek forgiveness for you. This man, Uwais al-Qarni, as well as al-Najashi in Habasha, these are from the people that the ulama call al-Mukhadram. This means that a person who embraced Islam answered the call of the Prophet during the time of the Prophet, yet never met the Prophet, so he cannot be classified as a Sahabi. So he would technically be a Tabi'i, even though strictly he is a little above in status than that of a Tabi'i. Nevertheless, this is a virtuous man. He had good treatment of his mother. He could not come from Al-Yaman to meet the Prophet because of his treatment of his mother and other factors that prevented him. He is a person whose dua is answered. That's why the Prophet said, Let him seek forgiveness for you. And this is what Umar radiallahu an did. Even though Umar is more virtuous than Uwais al-Qarni any day of the week, but this is a special case, and a special fadila for Uwais that the Prophet would ask even his own companions to ask Uwais to seek forgiveness for you. He died during the Battle of Safin, fighting on the side of Ali radiallahu anhu. In another narration, the Prophet said, "Inna khayra tabi'ina rajulun yuqalu lahu Uwais." The best of the tabi'in is a man by the name of Uwais. The next chapter about the Prophet's instructions with regards to the people of Misr or Egypt. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari reports that the Prophet said, "Inna kum sataftahuna ardan yudkaru fiha al-qirat." You would soon conquer a land in which the qirat is used. This is a type of currency. فَاسْتَوْصُوا بِأَهْلِهَا خَيْرًا So take my good advice to treat its people well. فَإِنَّ لَهُمْ ذِمَّةً وَرَحِمًا For these people have a right of kinship. فَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ رَجُلَيْنِ يَقْتَتِلَانِ فِي مَوْضِعِ لَبِنَا فَاخْرُجْ مِنْهَا But if you see two people fighting for the space of a brick, then get out of that land. And Abu Dhar afterwards happened to pass by Rabi' and Abdurrahman, the two sons of Shurahbil, disputing over the space of a brick, and Abu Dhar left that land. He tells us here that the Egyptians have kinship with the Arab. How is this? Because the Arab are descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. And Ismail was the son of Hajar, a servant girl of Ibrahim. And Hajar was Egyptian. In any case, this narration is a fadila for the people of Egypt in that the Sahaba were taught to treat them well. Take my advice to treat its people well. فَإِنَّ لَهُمْ ذِمَّةً They have a dhimma, meaning they have a sanctity. وَرَحِمَةً They have ties of kinship from Hajar, like we said. The next chapter about the fadail of the people of Oman from Abu Barza. He said the Prophet sent a man to a particular tribe. They reviled him and beat him. The man came back and narrated this to the Prophet. To which the Prophet said, لَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ عُمَانَ أَتَيْتَ مَا سَبُّوكْ وَمَا ضَرَبُوكْ If you were to go to the people of Oman, they would not revile you nor hit you. So in this there is a fadil of the people of Oman in that they are gentle people. And gentleness does not enter into anything except that it beautifies it. Racism is when you would speak about a whole race in a negative way or a derogatory fashion. But the opposite of racism, if you were to speak about a people in a positive way, is permissible, as the Prophet does so here, about the people of Oman. The next chapter, about the great liar of Thaqif and the great slaughterer. Abu Nawfal reports that I saw the dead body of Abdullah ibn Zubair, 
hanging on the road of Medina leading to Mecca. The Quraysh would pass by it. Abdullah ibn Umar passed by it. He stood up there and said, Aslamu alayka, Aba Khubayb. Abu Khubayb was the kunya of Abdullah ibn Zubayr. He said, Oh Abu Khubayb, by Allah, I used to forbid you from this. And he said this three times, referring to disputing with Al Hajjaj. By Allah, as far as I know, you used to be someone who fasted much and prayed much and joined much ties of kinship. By Allah, the group to which you belong, who are labeled as wicked people, are indeed good people. Then Abdullah went away. And these words of Abdullah were conveyed to Al Hajjaj, who was the one who murdered Abdullah ibn Zubayr. And to these words, Al Hajjaj took the body of Abdullah ibn Zubayr down and he threw his corpse into the grave of the Jews. Then he sent for his mother, Asma bint Abi Bakr, who refused to come. Then he asked for her to come again and she refused and he said, She must come or we will pull her by the hair to us. And she said, I will not come until you bring somebody who will pull me by the hair to you. So to this Al Hajjaj himself came to her, walking to her, swollen with his pride. He asked her, How do you find what I have done with the enemy of Allah? Referring to Abdullah ibn Zubayr. She said, You have destroyed his world and he has destroyed your afterlife. She says, It has been conveyed to me that you used to call him, meaning Abdullah ibn Zubayr, the son of the woman with two belts. And she says, Yes, I am the woman with two belts. With one of these belts, I used to suspend the food high for the Prophet and Abu Bakr so that the other animals may not reach it. As for the other belt, then it is one which no woman can dispense with. This simply means to say the normal belt which women would customarily wear. And I heard the Prophet say that from Thaqif there will be a Kathab, a liar, and a Mubir, one who destroys much. As for the Kathab, the liar, then we have seen him. And as for the Mubir, the one who destroys much, then I do not think it is anyone except you. And to this Al-Hajjaj stood up and did not answer her back. We find here that Al-Hajjaj has put the body of Abdullah ibn Zubayr up for everyone to see, so as to make an example of him. Ibn Zubayr was wronged, and it was Al-Hajjaj who was the oppressor. As if that wasn't bad enough, he throws his body into the grave of the Yahud, which shows his contempt for Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu an. Asma bint Abi Bakr says, uh, the Prophet mentioned from Thaqif there will be a liar and she is here referring to Al-Mukhtar Thaqafi who claimed to receive revelation from Jibreel. And as for the Mubir, the destroyer, then this has to be Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. He committed much oppression and killed many Sahaba. He had some good deeds but they were far overwhelmed by his evil and his affair is with Allah Jalla wa ala. The next chapter about the virtue of the Persians. From Abu Huraira, he says we were sitting with the Prophet. Surah Al-Jum'ah was revealed to him and it had the words وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ and others amongst them who have not joined them yet. They asked the Prophet, who are these people? The Prophet did not reply until they asked about twice or thrice and the Prophet struck Salman al-Farisi who was sitting with them and said لَوْ كَانَ الْإِيمَانُ عِنْدَ الثُرَيَّةِ لَنَالَهُ رِجَالٌ مِنْ هَؤُلَى even if the Iman was up in the stars, men from these types of people, referring to the Faris, would still reach it. Salman from Faris, Persia, had a long journey in search of the truth, but he never gave up. He showed resoluteness and persistency, and in the end he reached his ultimate goal. That's why the Prophet says even if it was up at the stars, people like Salman al farisi would still reach it. Like how they say, where there's a will, there is a way. If you want something bad enough and you're persistent, then there is no failure where there is persistence. The last chapter of this book of Fadail, one camel out of a hundred fit for riding. From Ibn Umar, the Prophet said, تَجِدُونَ النَّاسَ كَإِبْلٍ مِئَةٍ لَا يَجِدُ الرَّجُلُ فِيهَا رَاحِلًا You will find the people to be like one hundred camels. You will not even find one camel fit for riding. The Rahila is the one you ride on and can carry your luggage and property on. He's saying the people will be like a hundred camels. So that is to say many, many camels. You can scarcely find amongst the people one who will bear the burden of others and help them and generally have positive qualities. Because most of mankind 
is misguided and have succumbed to the whispers of shaitan. Let us take some review questions at this stage. So question number one. We have found that angering the righteous servants of Allah Jalla wa ala leads to angering Allah himself. What evidence do we have to prove this point? Question number two. What two qualities made the women of Quraysh the most noble of the Arab women? And what would this say generally about what makes a woman noble or what gives a woman a noble status? Question number three. What type of allegiance did the Prophet forbid in Islam? What is called the Hilf? And what type of allegiance did he allow?